Who is starting? I, I don't know. This is uh, <laughs> Okay, this is natural start to a podcast, so hello and bonjour, everyone. <laughs> We're in Canada this week, covering the case of Melissa Ann Stewart, the internet black widow. But before we get started on that, we'd like to tell you a bit about this podcast, as it's our first episode. Yeah, so welcome to Around the World in 80 Murders. Um, as the title of our show might indicate, we are going to be covering a different murder in a different country each week. Well, we're going to do 80 different countries on the first way around. We're going to work our way from Canada, around the world, and back to Canada again. That's and the then idea. we'll, yeah, then we'll just keep going from there if you want us to, really. Um, Anyways, yeah. uh, should I we introduce I, ourselves? Yeah, some host introductions. My name's Julia. I'm Alex. And we're both huge true crime fans. And we decided to start a podcast because I ran out of books. <laughs> so let's just jump into it. Okay. The Internet Black Widow, Melissa, Shepard, Friedrich, Russell, many last names throughout she, this story. Too many last names. You only need one last name. Or maybe two. So she was born Melissa Ann Russell on May 16th, 1935, in a small village called Burnt Church, New Brunswick, which has an interesting history as to how it received its name. So this little community uh, has been around for approximately a thousand years. From at A thousand least... years? <laughs> More like... 500. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Uh, there's evidence that the uh, community's oh, been around there for a lot okay. longer. I forgot to put that in the... Uh, <laughs> I forgot to put something in the script. Okay. Sorry about that. But um, in the about the 1600s, the uh, French arrived to build some new settle their first settlements in Canada, uh, essentially taking over the area from the Mi'kmaq people who lived there. And the people who live in that region, uh, or well, the French people who in lived in that region, came to be known as the Acadians. Now, in 1758... A British campaign to raid villages on the coast of New Brunswick took place. Large parts of the Mi'kmaq and Acadian communities around uh, the area known as Burnt Church were destroyed. Most significantly, the Acadian church was burnt down, lending itself to the name of the village. Burnt Church. So, Melissa's parents, her mother was an 18-year-old alcoholic, and her father is unknown. Uh, she was left at her grandmother's when she was born, who lived with her uncle. Now, her uncle was a pedophile who sexually assaulted her until he left to fight in World War II. And we don't really have much about Melissa until 1955 when she moves to Ontario and marries a man by the name of Russell Shepard, with whom she has two kids. A lot, not a lot is known about their marriage. Um, however, in 1971, Russell was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease. Now, this is when Melissa started kind of slipping into a life of crime as she began forging checks under aliases to continue being able to pay for basic goods. Now, in 1980, Melissa is convicted, uh, convicted of about 30 separate instances of th fraud and forgery under four different names, com committed in uh, Toronto, Ontario, and Georgetown, PEI. And she spends about five years in prison for that. When she's released in December of 1985, she moves back to Prince Edward Island with her family, and she gets a job working as a real estate agent. <laughs> Which you can somehow get. <laughs> with You can somehow get a job as a real estate agent while having 30 different charges for fraud and forgery, which... Ah, the 80s. Yes. I don't think there were many background <laughs> checks there. So anyway, she's released from pri yes, she's released from prison, and she starts working as a real estate agent, and then she just kind of, after moving with her family to PI, she just kind of abandons them. Yeah, and that's about that's about all that was written about Russell Shepard and yeah, her two children. Yeah, we know well, we know Russell Shepard did actually live quite a long life. He didn't he uh, according to a um, obituary I found he didn't die until uh, I believe January of twenty twenty. Damn. <laughs> So, despite having been diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease 50 years before, he somehow managed to live uh, that long with it. I yeah, don't know anything about the disease that's itself, like though. 50 years. Yeah, I don't know anything about that yeah, disease, though. Either. I'm not exactly educated in biology. We aren't medical experts. Yes, so. don't take medical advice from us. No. <laughs> anyway, so, around the time working as a real estate agent, Melissa, aged 54, meets a man by the name of Gordon Stewart, aged 42. While Gordon is trying to sell a piece of land that he had after his wife died. Um, so Gordon had about $50,000 in the bank, which is about 95 Canadian today. And he just left the ar he just left the army, so he also had a pension. They were married in Las Vegas after a few months of dating in February of 1989. Uh, and at this time, Melissa was still married to Russell Shepard, her first husband. 
Despite their marriage, Melissa raised several suspicions in Gordon's family members. So a uh, police officer who knew Gordon's brother also knew about the reputation of, of, uh, Melissa, of Melissa. Her fraud charges and all yeah. that. Yeah, he knew about her fraud charges because some, I don't know how, but he just managed to know about them. And also Gordon's sister Kate had similar doubts. When she first met Melissa, Melissa recounted the story about how badly her first husband beat her. And she described... An instance where he had even shot her in the hand, despite there being no medical records or even a or scar like, yeah, or lasting nothing. injury. Because imagine the <laughs> imagine the like amount of rehabilitation you would need if you got shot in the hand with all the muscles and tendons in there. So there's no evidence that this happened. And what makes it slightly more weird is the fact that Melissa uh, told Gordon's sister this on the first time they met. Like this is this isn't after knowing them for a while. This is literally the first. Imagine the first time meeting your brother's new uh girlfriend and she tells you that <laughs> so anyway uh after getting married they uh moved to charlottetown P pei and here gordon developed a drinking problem people around him described him as a man who drank too much but not necessarily a chronic alcoholic which is a fine line i don't, I, is, I, yeah. I don't know where's the it's line a very for? specific description yeah you could yeah, he's a man who drinks too much but he's not an alcoholic he'd I mean, do like maybe like one shot a night not an alcoholic, but a man who drank too much. Do you think one <laughs> shot a night is drinking too much? Let's not get into it. <laughs> Jesus. No, I'm joking. <laughs> At one point, Gordon told his sister Kate about a time Melissa had given him a cup of tea that lulled him to sleep for three days. When he awoke, his bank account had been drained and Melissa had vanished. So because of that, <laughs> because of having his bank account drained, Gordon filed for bankruptcy. And shortly after that, Melissa returned to him, having burnt through all the monies. She had nothing left, so she had to crawl back to Gordon, so, who took her back. And they moved to Vancouver in search of a fresh start, where they were married once again. Still, Melissa had not got divorced from her first husband, Russell Shepard, so I'm fairly certain that would make those marriages, like, invalid, right? Yeah, like, I don't think that's legal. Yeah, I don't think you get married more than once. So anyway, they just kind of hang around in uh, Vancouver for f four or five months, then just decide to move back across to the other side of the country, back, back to, Charlotte to Charlottetown. But that was, but that was um, what Gordon did alone. Oh, yes. Gordon left Melissa shortly afterwards yes. and was back by himself. However, Melissa finds him in Charlottetown and he takes her back again. And like, what makes that more suspicious is late that month, Gordon was admitted to the hospital, foaming at the mouth and seriously disorientated. His test results indicated large amounts of benzodiazepine in his system, which is a psychoactive drug used to calm or sedate a person, often prescribed to treat anxiety, insomnia, or seizures. The important thing to know about benzodiazepine is that it should not be taken with any alcohol whatsoever, as they can cause extreme drowsiness, lower your breathing rate to a dangerous level, cause confusion, slurred speech, loss of muscle control, and in some circumstances, a coma. <laughs> <laughs> despite these warning messages, nothing came of this suspicious event, despite the fact that Gordon had never been prescribed such a drug, and therefore nothing was done to pre prevent what would soon to come. So in February of 1991, Melissa called the police and accused Gordon of assaulting her over a missing check. Gordon was put in prison for it, and while he was in prison, she tried to visit him, but she wasn't admitted because she wasn't on the list of people allowed to visit him, Mainly because he was accused of, of uh, assaulting her. <laughs> her, and they typically don't allow people. Yeah. Like they don't typically don't allow vic uh, abuse victims to vi visit their abuser. So she shows up a few days later. Somehow nobody at the prison remembers her. I guess maybe different staff working or something. Maybe she had a disguise on. We yeah, she know. was wearing a fake mustache <laughs> and a fedora. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so she pretends to be his sister, gets in, and convinces him to sign a check for four hundred dollars from him to her. So, Gordon's released a couple weeks later, penned uh, on a year-long probation, and told to stay late away from Melissa. Mm -hmm. So, naturally, the two moved to Dartmouth in Halifax, Nova Scotia, in April of 1991. So, one month later. One month into his year-long probation, where he is not to be anywhere near Melissa. So, once they're in Halifax, they get an apartment, uh, they get a car... And they go around getting, go to the uh, office of their apartment building and apply for employment. So they just kind of dawdle around in uh, Halifax for a couple of weeks. And on Saturday, April 20th, 1991, 
Melissa and Gordon went in their blue 1984 Chevrolet Cavalier to Goff's, Nova Scotia, an area that pretty much just contains Halifax International Airport and all it's the affiliated well businesses. It's well known if it contains Halifax's only international airport. Listeners, <laughs> as, as a bit of background information, I've, I've spent about five years living in Halifax, and yeah, the only reason you go out there is for the airport, because it contains the airports, some hotels, a rental car You mean Goff's? Goff's. Not Halifax. <laughs> yes, Halifax has slightly more stuff than that. So around 4.30 that day... A woman by the name of Janice LaForest is cut off by a blue sedan, presumably the one driven by Melissa, forcing her to slam on her brakes. She recalls seeing a woman in the driver's seat and a man kind of slouched in the passenger seat. So she Perhaps. noted that the, yeah, she noted that the car had PEI license plates, but she couldn't identify the women the, the woman driving as she was only behind her for about half a mile before she got home. But she later told the RCMP about the car that cut her off when an officer arrived at her house and asked, asked to use the phone. So it was completely coincidental that this report is even, like, present. <laughs> yeah, it just so happens that the area is so goddamn desolate that you have to <laughs> yeah. go to just... That her house is the nearest her house is the nearest one to the, the scene of or whatever. something that happens later. Um, so a couple hours later, between, like, 6 and 6.30... A couple by the names of Elizabeth Casey and James Coakley witnessed Melissa's car while exploring country roads in the area. Ah, um, yes. Lovely country roads yes. out by the airport. It's my favorite place to go. <laughs> so much trees and mud out there. And grass. And mm. depression. <laughs> they described seeing a car fastly approaching them. And in a quote from Elizabeth, she recalls, she slowed up and went over what I considered was a log and then sped up. She forced her way around us. When the car went over the log, I saw it kind of vibrate, go up and down. I knew it was a person. I was screaming at Jimmy to look and see if it was a person. So Elizabeth also noted that the woman showed no emotion when driving over the man, continuing on her way straight past them. So the couple, in a surprisingly clever move, Surprisingly clever. Yeah. I feel like that's really insulting towards those people. I don't know anything about that, but they couple immediately try and get the license plate number, going so far as even follow Melissa's car for five kilometers until they were able to get it down. Then they go to the house of somebody they knew lived nearby and call the police in an ambulance because it's 1991 and nobody has a cell phone yet. I don't even think Halifax had cell phone coverage until the late 90s. Oh God. <laughs> and especially out here, I can barely get cell phone coverage now. So, when they returned to the scene to check on the man, upon arriving, they saw Gordon lying face down in the middle of the road. He was already dead due to the severity of the injuries, and he suffered a broken neck along with internal bruising of the forehead. All of his ribs were crushed, which resulted in a liter of blood flooding into his chest cavity and a cut liver, resulting in a half liter of blood flooding in his abdominal cavity. <laughs> the silver lining to all of this um, trauma is that he was likely already dead when he was run over by a car. Or he was at least heavily comatose. Yeah. Because according to the autopsy that was performed later, he uh, was found to have a lethal amount of liquor in his system, including rubbing alcohol, acetone, along with 500 milligrams or 30 pills worth of benzodiazepine. As we've already covered the side effects of what happens when you mix alcohol and benzodiazepine. And those ones are any alcohol and benzodiazepine, so we're already a alcohol poisoning level of alcohol and a drug that you know that could cause a coma if you have any alcohol with it likely implies that he was at least probably on the verge of death or heavily comatose at the time so the first officer on the scene arrives at about 7 15 p.m rcm constable leatherdale who was stationed <laughs> at the airport leatherdale. that's there are a lot of strange police officer names in this episode especially in nova scotia the uh, constable who arrived on the scene noticed uh, the state of Gordon's body, checked him for any signs of life, found that he was dead, and noted that Gordon sh one of Gordon's shoes was approximately 10 feet down the road uh, from where he was laid. So he must have been uh, hit at some speed. Um, as we mentioned, the autopsy revealed that he was kind of in a comatose state from all these this alcohol and the benzodiazepine, which, from uh, past events, suggests foul, foul play on Melissa's part. There are two kind of possibilities here that were being debated, which is Gordon's alcoholism versus Melissa tampering with what Gordon ate that day. 
Frank Burke, who was a doctor who knew the couple back in Prince Edward Island, said that they had come over to his house unexpectedly one evening. Gordon was drunk, almost unable to stand, and asked for booze. However, an employee of the Metro Drug Dependency Center in Dartmouth testified that the couple had been in on April 12th to check Gordon into detox because Melissa said he needed to be treated before taking on his new job, despite the manager of the building saying there was no alcohol screening criteria and no evidence that he had been drinking. Additionally, the breathalyzer test he received at the clinic yielded a reading of 0. .001, which is an 80th of the legal limit in Nova Scotia. Yeah, so he's a state of intoxication so low it's barely readable. I don't. I think that's the lowest level of reading you can have that isn't zero. Basically, there's a lot to support that Gordon did not consume alcohol on his own will. Yes, he may have been a drink, may have been a heavy drinker, but he wasn't drunk at the time. He was just a man who drank too much. Yes, but not, not a chronic alcohol. alcoholic, which is what will be on my gravestone. <laughs> oh, that's depressing. Anyways, we'll be taken to 9pm that night when Melissa turns herself in to the uh, Dartmouth police station. She's interviewed by Inspector Meisner. So I'm guessing she turns herself in after she was seen by Casey and Coakley. So when she, she drives past them, doesn't acknowledge them, but in her mind she's like, shit. Somebody saw me. So and they followed so me boys. as well. So for those of you who don't know, Dartmouth is on the opposite side of a kind of bay to Halifax. And even though I lived there, I didn't know this, that they had an entirely separate police force until 1996. And as the murder had taken place close to uh, Dartmouth and Halifax, the um, Dartmouth police kind of took charge in it with uh, working with the RCMP. So uh, Melissa confessed to Inspector Meisner that on the morning of the 27th, her estranged husband, Gordon Stewart, had broken into her apartment in the Franklin Court complex in Dartmouth about 6 a.m. He forced her... He forced her at knife point into their car, and they drove to the road where um, Gordon Stewart would, would, wait, would later die. They even... So, the during the time that Gordon broke into her apartment, which she claimed was 6 a.m., he they just spent the day driving around Nova Scotia. They even stopped at a restaurant in a, a little town nearby. Called Shubanaki. Shubanaki. Shubenakadi. Shubenakadi. And Melissa also discussed what he'd been drinking, which included wood alcohol. Whatever and wood alcohol means. Oh, it's, um, I think, I think it's alcohol, like, distilled from... From wood? Yes. <laughs> it's, I, I don't know, it's stuff you're not supposed to drink. I think it's, like, oh, stuff God. used in, like, industrial processes. Oh, and, boy. Like, uh, yes. like paint Wood thinner. alcohol. Yeah, but also shaving lotion as well. And she also claimed that they didn't live together. However, there is... A lot of evidence that counteracts yeah, this claim. So, such as the police searching her apartment and finding his wallet on her bedside table, um, a pair of men's rubber boots, and medis medication prescribed to him. And that medication was inside a uh, suit that was in the closet. And if that's not enough proof, according to the manager of the complex, the uh, job that we mentioned a little while earlier that the couple had applied for was a... Um, well, was the job of superintendent of the building. So they had applied together for the position to the building manager. And as we mentioned earlier, they'd also been to the um, uh, drug drug dependency centre together. So, And also numerous people saw them together. Most concerningly, in, her, in, the, in the apartment that they shared, they found 17 bottles of pills prescribed to Melissa under two different names. These inclu included a prescription for Valium, a type of benzodiazepine, and a sedative called Restoril. The, pain the pills in her apartment were from numerous different doctors, including the aforementioned Dr. Frank, Frank Burke. Burke. Uh, Dr. Frank Burke's an interesting one because uh, in 2003, he had his medical license revoked for allegations of overprescribing tranquilizers to the extent that nearly 1,000 of his 7,500 patients had become addicted. Insane. Um... So continuing with Melissa's confession, confession we'll call it, to the police, she claimed that uh, she tried to escape when Gordon got out to pee, but the car suddenly backed over him, and she then drove off. Mm -hmm. um, this is immediately contradicted by the fact that the pathologist testified that his bladder was full when he died. That's, so, that's Gordon Stewart, not the pathologist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, maybe, well, maybe the pathologist. Who knows? Yeah, it's pathologist. Like, <laughs> what time was it? It was, oh, it was 6 p.m. on the 27th. <laughs> yeah, I think my bladder was full back then. 
And Melissa made no mention of the other car on the road who saw her, even though it would have been pretty hard for her to miss that. Yeah. Considering, considering she drove right past Yeah, because she had to, like, they almost describe it as having to, like, swerve around the car, because it's a country road. I can't imagine it's, like, the widest yeah. thing in the world for two cars. And considering that they, they followed her for five kilometers, yeah, she would have noticed. Yeah, so the uh, car itself was searched, and a fishing knife, dirt, and... Evergreen needles were found in the back seat. Following the search, the uh, approximately around the same time as the uh, search was being done, the interview came to a sudden end the at around 3am, uh, when Melissa confessed that she deliberately backed over Gordon. The next morning, Melissa was examined by Dr. Catherine Robinson, who testified that Melissa told her she'd been sexually, sexually assaulted by Gordon on a road near the woods between 4 and 6 p.m., the time of Gordon's death. Furthermore, uh, Dr. Robinson said Stewart had told her that the assailant held a knife to her throat and threatened to kill her if she didn't have sex with him. Additionally, she testified that she did not find any traces of semen or sperm on either Stewart or her clothes. However, Robinson said that Stewart had also told her that she had bathed in the intervening hours between the killing and her turning herself in. So, Melissa would have driven home, mm -hmm. showered after the event, and then gone to the police. I mean, from what I remember, it's only like a 20-minute drive between the place where the murder took place and the uh, location where their apartment is. Okay. So, she had time to stop. She oh, had time yeah. to freshen up. Oh, yeah. She had, like... Well, there was... I think it was... What time did she turn herself in? 9 p.m.? And the murder took place at about... Yeah, 9 p.m. 6.30? Yeah, around, around 6.30. So, yeah, two and a half hours. Uh, well, that is actually corroborated by the constable working the front desk of the police station, where she turned herself in, as she also told him that she had gone home, washed up, and then changed out of her muddy clothes. Now, a further investigation of the area by the RCMP using Boz, a German Shepherd tracking dog. <laughs> How did you find his name? It was in the article. It was in an article. It was, it was, it, they thought this is important detail to yeah, include. Well, there was also the name of the uh, handler as well, but I wasn't that interested in the handler, just the dog. <laughs> uh, so that indicates no trace of human scent were found in the location, with especially no evidence of any kind of assault. And this is despite the uh, weather conditions being cool and not raining, which... Uh, it would have preserved something on the ground. Yeah, essentially th that condition, cool and not raining, is what they consider the ideal conditions to preserve evidence. Yeah. Like some form of struggle should have been found. Yeah, or any kind of human... If they can't find a human scent, that's got to mean... Yeah. Does that mean they even got out of the car or anything? Um, I don't know. If there's no well, human... obviously Gordon was out of the car. Well, yeah, yeah, but, he, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, but we don't know. Yeah, we don't know the exact. Same, we don't even know where they went or what they did, or if well, there was any yeah. like mud on their shoes or anything. Yeah, exactly. So it means that like the, Gordon was probably out of the car for like one minute before Melissa ran him over. Yeah, for all we know, she could have dumped him out of the car, then backed over him. Exactly. Yeah. So anyway, this goes to trial, and a eight-day preliminary inquest takes place quick visit to legal corner here a preliminary Welcome to alex's legal corner yes my legal corner i'm not a lawyer but i can use the internet uh so a preliminary inquest is when a judge reviews a case to determine if there's enough evidence to take it to trial following uh following the uh, preliminary inquest which finishes on november 2nd the decision is made that the case will be taken to trial and it begins in may of 1992 a year after the murder took place 39 people testified in the trial with a jury of seven women and five men under the supervision of Justice William Grant. And among those who testified were the adult kids of Gordon Stewart, who stated that he was physically abusive towards his first wife. During the trial, while the uh, Crown Attorney is uh, describing how uh, they believe uh, Melissa carried out the murder, she s uh, <laughs> Melissa slowly falls to her right and is assisted by, by the Sheriff's officers to the bathroom and temporary recess is so called. She slowly falls. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Like she faints. But faints, but very slowly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm assuming that means like losing balance or something. Yeah. Anyway, it's not, it's not very clear. I got this, I got most of the information comes from uh, local uh, newspaper articles I, I found mean, from the time. Sus. So the Halifax, the Halifax Daily News, which understandably isn't in business anymore. They went out of business in 2008. Sorry for any former Halifax Daily News reporters out there. <laughs> when court resumed, Potts proceeded with her address, outlining, outlining the accused process of planning the murder, including stocking up on the prescription sedatives, her motives behind the murder, and the series of events that led up to Gordon Stewart's death. Then, Stewart's defense attorney addressed the jury, accusing the Crown of relying on speculation and innuendo to make their case, saying that the Crown had provided no evidence to disprove Melissa's story, 
and dismissing the Crown's theory that the killing was for monetary purposes, with them calling his $550 per month pension a paltry sum. I mean, it's a bit insulting, but I know not wrong. I don't, I don't actually know what that is in today's money. I normally, oh, I normally do that for these ones, but I just kind of forgot to do it for that amount. I want to say it's on the low side, but I mean, it's still enough. Yeah, especially in Halifax, it's, it's, the it's cost a... of living in Halifax is much lower. Yeah, than especially if you this were is in, thirty like, years Vancouver. ago. Vancouver. Yeah, this yeah. is thirty years ago as well, when Halifax wasn't exactly as much of a boomtown as it is today. Yeah, exactly. It's a little bit of a boomtown now. It went it's from like being a not little, a boomtown. They've got a, a shipping. Bit, a they've bit, got a bit. shipping. They've got shipbuilding, and and. Uh... Anyways, <laughs> moving on from Halifax's illustrious industrial past. So the day before his death. Gordon had arranged for the payment for the superintendent job to go directly to his personal account. The judge stated that the jury could return one of three verdicts. Guilty as charged, guilty of the lesser charge of manslaughter, or not guilty. After the three-week trial, the jury deliberated for ten hours over two days and returned the verdict of guilty of manslaughter, with her being sentenced to six to ten years in prison and her being released on $40,000 bail for two days to sort out her affairs. On the day that she left court, she left court in the exact same car that she killed Gordon Stewart with, the blue 1984 Chevrolet Cavalier. And a bit of extra trivia about that car, it weighs about 2,500 pounds, which, <laughs> that's got to hurt when it runs over you. Luckily for Gordon, he was likely not awake to feel it. Old 2,500 well, not, pounds. Well, not to call Gordon Stewart lucky, but you know what I mean. Yeah, he's not exactly... In light of the circumstances. I mean, if, if you have to be run over by a car, I guess I'd it might be better be to be unconscious. Yeah, Yes, you don't want, like, your ribs poking into your internal organs like you Like, kidding? what happened to Gordon Stewart? He got hit by a car. Yeah, but he got... His ribs were all crushed. And his organs were all punctured. Are we gonna edit this bit out? <laughs> yeah, maybe we should. This yes. is dark. Okay, anyway, so... <laughs> now on to Melissa's time in prison. So she was sent to the creatively named Prison for Women in Kingston, Ontario, which itself has quite the controversial history. Yeah. So, as some of listeners may know, it housed notorious serial killer Carla Homolka, who, with Paul Bernardo, killed three women in uh, the St. Catharines area in the 1980s. The Institute also performed experiments on inmates without their knowledge in the early 1960s, dosing 23 inmates with LSD and observing the effect it had on them. In December of 1994, she requested a 15-day pass to go to PEI to visit her pregnant daughter and ex-husband, who she said was dying of cancer. I guess this is Russell yeah, this Shepard? Is, yeah, this is Russell Shepard again. The one, yeah, as I said, he didn't die until January of 2020. So How? this is the second time he's, yeah. supposedly di- he's supposedly dying, but so he just hasn't died. So this must be di- a lie, then. I'm not sure. I, may, I kind of believe the first one, but not the second one. It's just, if she knew her daughter was pregnant, does that mean she kept in touch with Russell Shepard and her, ch- and her kids? I guess it must be. They don't really... I think this is, like, the last time they come up in the story. Okay. Like, they ne- they, they're they practically never mentioned again. Okay. Maybe that's for the better. I mean... For them. Yeah, like, the only, t- the only other mention I can see about the kids is that I know they're still alive because they were mentioned in uh, Russell's obituary. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I found and indicates that he, <laughs> he managed to live till uh, January of 2020, which is wow. pretty impressive. Anyways, by the time of this request, she had already been released from the prison for women on day parole into a federal halfway house for women with her working days as a waitress. And it was there she did some commendable work for the benefit of current and former inmates. She proposed and even pitches to the Deputy Solicitor General and Commissioner of the Correctional Service of Canada two projects. One called Project Another Chance, a counseling line for female convicts, which seem to still exist up to this day, as program of the community justice initiatives known as STRIDE. And another that was a treatment center for female convicts with drug and alcohol problems, which was rejected due to lack of money and due to the present being scheduled to close in the coming years. What she did between 1997 and the year 2000 isn't exactly clear, but we know that she went missing from a halfway house for three days in October of 1997, which resulted in her parole being suspended. And what she claims happened was that she claimed she'd been missing for three days because two people involved with the uh, inmate program that she organized had come to her apartment, slipped drugs into her soda, and then beat her unconscious where she remained for three days. Much like what happened to Gordon Stewart when he was unconscious for three days. Huh, I didn't, I, I didn't actually make that link. Well done. Yeah, so 
bit of a bit of a coincidental story, if true, and knowing Melissa's lies as told in her confession to the police. Yeah, in, in some instances I want to believe her, but she just she has just told doesn't so have a many good track lies. Record. She's just told so many lies and well committed a fraud, forgery, possible well at least manslaughter. <laughs> yeah. Convicted of manslaughter, possible murder. Uh, but that's for the legal system to decide. Not exactly the uh, best track record for reliability or honesty. Yeah. Anyways, uh, we will now be moving on to her relationship with Robert Frederick. Is it Friedrich? You know, German? Friedrich? Fre- I probably Fre- Frederick. Didn't that yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> it just sounds like I'm saying Frederick rather than Frederick. Friedrich, yes. We will be uh, making up our own pronunciations in this show. Yes. Robert so... Friedrich. Fried Rice. Robert Fried Rice. An 83-year-old retired engineer from Pittsburgh who lived in Florida and who was a widower. So the details surrounding how Melissa and Robert met are fuzzy, to say the least. And we have sources that contradict one another on the topic. For example, um, some of the information we find comes from a interview from the uh, CBC show The Fifth Estate with um, Lyndon McIntyre. And according to that interview, Melissa was at the Christian retreat in Florida in March of 2000 and apparently had an experience with the Holy Spirit that indicated that Robert Friedreich would... Just say Robert. Just say that Robert. <laughs> that Robert would be her next husband. This apparently happened while she was up on a platform in front of the church with the pastor, and the Holy Spirit pointed Robert out to her and told her that he was the man that she was to marry. Now, the other sources that we found said that in April of 2001, Melissa wrote to Robert, who she claimed she had seen in a Christian retreat newsletter. Perhaps in an attempt to manipulate him using his faith, her letter stated she believed God intended for them to marry. He invited her to meet him in Florida, and within days of her arrival, he had agreed to marry her. After a free day, a three-day engagement, they eloped to the romantic Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Yes, yeah, so return to Dartmouth. For those of you who've been to Halifax, you know there's nothing more romantic than Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. And they go there in June of 2001 to get married. Then they return to Bradenton, Manatee County, Florida, and marry again in October of 2001, like this... after the, which they bought a house. This wouldn't be... A true murder story if it didn't involve Florida in some way. I do love. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, I wouldn't normally include the county name, but it's just such a fantastic. Manatee County. I want to live in Manatee. Actually, no, I don't. I'd have to live in Florida. But Manatee County is my favorite county name I've seen so far. So together they buy a house and move in together. Um. So in the months following the marriage, Robert's family members noted failing health conditions, which was. Very similar to what happened when Melissa married Gordon. All of a sudden, he became like disoriented alcoholic. Robert's situation got increasingly worse to the point where one of his sons actually phoned the elder abuse line, claiming his new wife was to blame for his deteriorating state. In 2002, August of 2002, Robert removed his sons from his will, making Melissa his sole beneficiary of his $100,000 estate. So Robert's health kept declining, and he subsequently died on the 16th of December 2002, with the cause of death being reported as a cardiac arrest. So Melissa continues to live in the house that they bought together, and continues to collect his social security payments for two years before returning to PEI. Now, suspicions were aroused in the, uh, in the, uh, the family. family of Robert. <laughs> It says, for, it says the family's name, but I can't pronounce that. And it was soon discovered by authorities that Melissa had held several pres- prescriptions for lorazepam, a drug containing benzodiazepine. Although the police felt that they uh, didn't really have any evidence to uh, investigate, as uh, Robert was in poor health and 84 years old. and He very uh, well the, could have passed away from yeah, cardiac have, arrest. Yes. And uh, another issue with that is that Robert had been cremated shortly after his death, so there was no body to investigate anyway. He couldn't do an autopsy mm-hmm. or anything. So shortly after, his sons filed a complaint with the sheriff's department, alleging that she killed their father, Melissa, by overdosing him on prescription medication. She killed their father, Melissa. <laughs> she... Melissa. Let me reword this. Yes. Who's to say that a father cannot be named Melissa today? Well, he's called Robert. It's written okay. down here well, he's called Robert. I'm just defending... <laughs> If there are any fathers named Melissa out there. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. It's just I not in this story. I have your back. I'm on your side. I see you. You are valid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yes, yeah, so <laughs> Melissa killed Robert by overdosing him on prescription medication, um, as well as a, the Robert's children accusing her of depleting his accounts, and the matter was eventually settled with them receiving all but $15,000 of his full $100,000 estate. 
There are some people who enjoy the subject of true crime, but find any attempt at inserting levity into it to be inappropriate and disrespectful towards the victims. But my problem with that is that I can agree sometimes you can be distasteful, but traditional true crime media can sometimes be even more disrespectful. And I found a great instance of this when they were uh, interviewing Robert's family for the aforementioned uh, CBC Fifth Estate documentary. So a reporter asks the uh, family what the worst case scenario they expected from Robert's new girlfriend was. And they responded that they believe she might be a gold digger. Then it cuts to a, a picture of uh, Melissa Stewart, slowly zooms in on her while playing like ominous stock music. And it says in a voiceover, in time they'd wish it was so simple, gold digger. Their father's bride had a sordid history as grave digger. <laughs> and I'm not making that up. That is word for word what they said. It's like sometimes people forget that it's not a fictional story and the events that happen become separated from reality and the people who are left behind from it. You don't, you don't want to say anything bad about the victims or really the victims' families, but there's so much ridiculous stuff around, around the concept of just a murder, you know? Like, mm -hmm. there's, you can have the incompetence of the police, the outlandishness of the trial, the, the murderer themselves tends to not be the most normal person mm -hmm. of all. That's our little true crime rant corner. So after spending a few years in Florida, living off of Robert's social security payments, she moved on to her next man, a man named Alexander Strategos. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Much like Strategos. 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 Yes. So Alex that. Strategos <laughs> was a 73-year-old divorced accountant living in Florida, originally from Pittsburgh. He was one of several men with whom Melissa had been corresponding on AmericanSinglesDating.com. <laughs> America's... Is that a true? Can we look that up? Is that I, a true dating website? I actually did go to the effort of looking that up, <laughs> and so far as I can tell, it doesn't exist anymore. Okay, so it was uh, a I can't find vintage it. dating site. Yes, it was American. It was pro yeah. It was probably, yeah, you can only be American and single on it, although... Did the, it, you're arrested we, if you're not American and then you're not single. It's that's like, the thing. I don't remember ever reading anything about her getting divorced from her first, first husband. No, I don't think she ever Russell, did. Yeah, she did just she kind ever, of, like, disappeared from his life. Did she ever divorce Russell Shepard? And anyway, uh, Alex Stratagos fell in love with Melissa almost immediately as she was nice, polite, sweet, and willing to do some light housekeeping that he couldn't handle due to mobility issues. Um, as she had previously done with Robert, Melissa portrayed herself as a devout Christian. On the night of their first date, two extraordinary events occurred that are colossal red flags given Melissa's history. Number one, she moved in with him in his apartment on their first date. And he was subsequently checked into the hospital for a severe head injury. This marked the first of his eight hospital visits during the time in which they were together. After the fact, Stratu Joss suggested that uh, she may have slipped a drug into his butter pecan ice cream. You even got the flavor of the ice cream. It was in the research. article. Why would they include that in the article? They <laughs> oh, that, oh, actually, I know why. Because he, he, as he later says in the Halifax Daily News, Halifax's least favorite newspaper, uh, that it was always the same flavor, though that flavor was always a little off. At first, at first when I tasted it, it tasted different. That's all. But then I figured it was at night and I was tired. His son corroborated the statement when, in a 2005 hospital visit, he noticed that benzodiazepine had shown up in his blood, despite it never having been prescribed to his father. It is at this point where Melissa became known in the media as the Internet Black Widow. And the, be the best thing about that is that she takes a particular issue with her moniker. As she said... Strategos was the only person I met on the internet, so how can they call me the Black Widow of the internet? So is she basically saying like, well, only one of my victims was met online, so... It's essentially, yeah, without, <laughs> without admitting to anything, she's just saying like, I only, yeah, he's the only person I met on the internet, so how can they call me the Black Widow of the internet? I mean, look, he's still alive. Spoiler alert, he's still alive. <laughs> Actually, no, he's dead now, but he was still alive at the time. He wasn't a murder victim, though. Oh, no. So uh, so his son, Dean, becomes concerned after seeing his father's health rapidly decline, despite him being, initially when they first met, being, aside from some mobility issues, relatively healthy physically. And he describes his father as getting re really drowsy and falling down. He couldn't even stand up without falling down. So shortly before she left Prince Edward Island in November of 2004 to meet Alexander... She was due to be charged with fraud over $5,000 after an investigation into crimes related to the Old Age Security Act started in January 2004. Uh, 
and was believed to have received $30,000 in pension funds using two different social security numbers under the names Melissa Stewart and Melissa Shepard, the names of her first two husbands. This investigation was dropped in 2009. So uh, Dean Stratkos uh, also noticed that uh, $18,000 was missing from his father's account and he phoned the authorities who promptly arrested Melissa. (laughs) So however- Good on them, good on them, doing their jobs. I guess. So however, during the the, uh, CBC interview, uh, in response to the mention of the (laughs) 18,000, Melissa said that uh, Stratkos didn't have $18,000 for her to clear out. (laughs) After a small investigation, she is convicted of grand theft, forgery, and ends up spending five years in prison. So in her release, after her release in 2009, she's deported back to Canada, where she moves into a senior's home in Nova Scotia. On the topic of the investigation in uh, Florida by the Pinellas Park Police, uh, they investigated the uh, possibility that she might have been slowly poisoning him. However, there wasn't enough effort evidence to support the claim, so they couldn't file an attempted murder charge. However, there was enough for the exploitation grand theft fraudery? Fraudery? Fraud? Fraud? Fraud, fraud forgery. Fraud, fraud forgery. Fraud, fraudery. Fraudery? Fraud... I can't... My brain's just broken. Anyways, moving swiftly on. In 2005, the police in Florida released a list of Melissa's known aliases, which totaled 13. These included... Melissa Shepard, Mel- Millicent Shepard, Melissa Russell, Ruth Shepard, Edna Johnson, Edna Cameron, Dorothy Sinclair, Rena Howe, Elizabeth Howard, Anna Keenan, Brenda Lyons, and Melissa Shapiro. As we said, she's released uh, from prison and she's deported to Canada because they don't want her in America. And at uh, that time, yet again, we have another we have another gap. We don't know what she does between two thousand and nine and twenty twelve, but we do know that prior to September of twenty twelve, she meets a man by the name of Fred Weeks, who is one of her neighbors in the uh, the seniors' apartment building that she moves into in Halifax after being deported. Weeks had lost his wife about eighteen months before mil- meeting Melissa. I think that left a sour taste in Fred Weeks' children's mouths. That eighteen, just eighteen months prior. He marries Melissa. So uh, they meet uh, in August and get married in September of 2012. So that's on the uh, 25th. For the honeymoon, they take the uh, ferry up to North Sydney, Nova Scotia and check into the Chambers guest house on the on the 28th. So around the time of the wedding, one of Fred's friends, George Magini? Magini? <laughs> Mag- Magini. Magini. Okay, George Magini has seen Melissa on a CBC documentary detailing her crimes called The Widow's Web. Now, this blows my mind that CBC made a documentary about Multiple her. Multiple documentaries. But she's, like, just a free woman. Like, there's no, like... Yeah, I think this is... Because there was this one in... There was The Widow's Web. There was The Fifth Estate. And also there was the National Film Board movie that I think we forgot to mention earlier from 1995. Right. The, uh... When Women Kill, I th- believe it was about. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was yeah. about abused wim- abused women who end up uh, murdering their abusers. So is she painted as like this victim? Abuse I think from that? what no, from what I remember, there was an interview after the um, fact. Uh, actually, after she was uh, arrested for the uh, Weeks case, and there was an interview with the the uh, woman who directed the uh, National Film Board documentary. And she said that it wasn't her goal of the uh, documentary to uh, determine whether or not the women were guilty or not. It was oh. just to tell the stories. Back to yeah. George McGainey. George McGainey is, a, I'd say he's a solid friend, really. He, he um, sees the documentary and tries to get the police to intercept their ferry on the way to um, their honeymoon. Their honeymoon, warning them of her previous crimes. However, in the fashion that's all too common with police officers, they turn a blind eye, refusing to involve themselves in the situation. So the uh, following morning, Melissa asks the innkeeper to call an ambulance for Fred as um, she complained that the ferry ride over was rocky and that her husband wasn't doing too well. Once the paramedics arrived, they found Fred lying on the floor by the bed, disoriented and weak. By this time, word had spread that Melissa had told people at the hospital that Fred had no children, suffered from dementia and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and that he had had multiple heart attacks. When such tales reach the ears of Fred's existing children, one can imagine how quickly her lies were shot down and suspicions of Melissa arose. So, uh, Weeks' son called the police who actually do their jobs this time and searched Melissa's apartment, finding a lot of benzodiazepine, approximately 144 tablets of lorazepam, a smaller amount of temazepam, 
three unlabeled empty bottles and five prescriptions all from different doctors and a tub of ice cream that a was sent to the lab for an- <laughs> a suspicious tub of ice cream i don't know what stuck out about Among that tub of tubs, ice cream yeah the police were like this ice cream tub is sus which it probably was because she used, she drug. Oh yeah, she did. Yeah, cream. she did. Yeah, she did. Track. She'll try to kill Stratagos in. Anyway, uh, oh yeah, one quick thing I forgot to mention about Stratagos. He managed to live. He lived until uh, twenty seventeen. Okay. So I mean, his health wasn't doing too. But his health wasn't doing brilliantly to begin with. Yeah. But uh, he managed to make it. He made it out. So luckily for Fred, Fred also survived the encounter. But Fred and- also died in twenty seventeen as well. But unrelated to Melissa. So yeah, he just he died. Survived. He just died of being old. <laughs> yes. I mean, actually, I don't. I don't think there's a record. I didn't see any record of how old Fred was. There so. wasn't anything in the Halifax Daily News. Oh no, they got. <laughs> I, actually, I think they got. Oh wait, yeah, they got out of business by now. Okay. Because it was 2012, yeah. but they went out of business in 2008. This They've whole, gone already. This whole episode is just uh, one big advertisement for the Halifax Daily News. So Fred survived up until his death, but he was unable to. <laughs> <laughs> He survived okay. up until he didn't. <laughs> he survived. He up survived. until. Are, aren't we all just surviving? Aren't we all just we... living are until we, we die? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well. He survived. He, yeah, he, he was perfectly fine after the encounter survived. and lived until 2017. Yes. Okay. Yes. He was unable to remember what actually occurred the night that he spent with Melissa, and his memory suffered tremendously, with him even believing that he never boarded the ferry. Fortunately for him, there was an error in their marriage license, which I guess there was an error in their marriage license, but there probably would have been other kind of legal issues, considering that she never actually divorced Russell Shepard. Well, so far as we know. Well, we well we do know that the reason that the marriage license, uh, license uh, was deemed invalid is because Melissa had provided false information on it. And <laughs> this takes us into the trial. Yep, yeah, so going under the name Melissa Ann Weeks... She is charged with attempted murder and administering a noxious substance with intent to endanger a life between the dates of September 24th and 30th of 2012. And the trial is scheduled for November 21st. So uh, during the trial, she claims that Fred had fallen multiple times during the ferry ride and even hit his head on more than one occasion. Which, I mean, I get it, he's old, but how do you do that so many times yeah. on a ferry ride? And, like, you, you just think not, other not people sitting down? notice, because yeah, the ferry is a small boat. Yeah, and, I mean, it's a rel- I, I know the ferry over to Sydney, I believe that's a relatively busy route. So you think, like, other people might come and help, like, help Yeah. Them. If he's like not... Like, the ferry if workers would be, like... Yeah, like, there's an old man who keeps falling down <laughs> and hitting his head. You think they might, like help him stay in his chair or do something. No. No, 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 just like the old man just bounce yeah. off the floor like a pinball. Like a pinball? What's like, a pinball like doing a, out of a machine? Like a pin, uh, a pin. Like a bouncy a ball. bowling pin. Bowling pin? Yeah, like a bowling pin falling down. Oh. <laughs> I, don't I don't know why it took so long for me to get that. In this trial, she faced the charge of attempted murder, but eventually pled guilty to the lesser charges of administering a noxious thing and failing to provide the necessities of life. Yeah, I, I find that law very vague. Name. Yeah, noxious the admi- thing. A noxious thing. That's, like, that, that's can... what the newspaper had written down. I'm... Like, uh, I couldn't find any court documents because like the substance no- would be much more professional. <laughs> yes, the Nova Scotia court website is absolute dog shit. It looks like it was made in like 1999 oh by a child, but uh, probably was. Probably was. <laughs> I I could build a better website than that. Anyway, she is sentenced to three and a half years in prison and is released on March 18th, 2016, under strict conditions into Halifax. And fun fact: I was living in Halifax at the time and don't remember this happening at all. But I'm definitely going to go. Around, I'm going to go call some of my old friends who live there and ask if they remember <laughs> that happening. And it was a pretty big deal at the time, as the Halifax Regional Police published a um, press release stating that she'd be living in the Halifax area and that she had been assessed and found to be at a high risk of reoffense. And so at this time, would... at this time, she's 81 years old. I don't understand this. So the police are like, "Yes, yes, she's a. Uh, there's a high risk that she will commit another felony." We're going to release her to live in this public area. I, I guess they have to release her because they only consented her for three and a half years under a certain law, I guess. I guess. Well, so, can they just re-sentence her, though? I don't know. No, I don't think that's how that I mean, works. So anyway, the latest news we have on her is from around 2016 and 2017, when she was taken back into custody after violating three conditions of the peace bond on which she was released. So you may be wondering, what are the three conditions that she violated? Well, she was spotted 
by a by a community police officer using a computer to access the internet in Halifax Public Library on Spring Garden Road, which I have to say is a very nice library. Uh, Seriously, so, all fancy. It's like glass and shit. Cool. It looks like as someone who is hoping to go study there next year. Oh, I that... look forward to it. <laughs> okay, we're gonna Google it. We're yes, Google it, guys. We're looking it up. Yeah. That is, oh, that's very modern. Yeah, I know. It's brand. Yeah, it opened like the year I left. Yeah, anyway, sorry. So li library subtract. One of the conditions was accessing the internet. That's a condition of the peace. That's bond? condition. She one of the conditions she broke. So wait, so you're not allowed to access the the internet? Oh, it. Oh, like as a convict or whatever. Okay. Well, I'll I'll let you under, under the conditions sorry. of her thing, you're not I allowed thought, to access the internet. I thought maybe for a second that anyone is just not allowed to access the internet, <laughs> and they break the peace bond. <laughs> <laughs> they break her peace bond if they access the internet. Well, I thought it was just like a peace bond that everyone follows. No, the, no, the peace <laughs> okay. bond is kind of like, uh, like conditional release almost. Okay, like, yeah, um, that makes more sense. Like it's, it's like parole, but with more conditions, I believe. Um, another was being within a twenty-five meter radius of a library. Yeah, Curious. so yeah, so there were twenty. I believe there were like twenty-seven to thirty different conditions that she had to follow, and those were just okay. two of them. I don't know what any other is. What was the library so important of? They were like they protected it in I the peace bond. I don't know. I guess no reading books. I I guess maybe like kids hang around libraries yeah. like unattended and um I guess it's got the internet yeah, there as no. well. Like free public internet. You don't you just walk in and just type on the computer. I guess she wasn't allowed to access the internet at all. No, right? no well, that's so, the first condition. Okay. Yeah. So then the last condition that she violated was when they searched her and found a portable device capable of accessing the internet, better known to use as a smartphone. Better us. known to us, us as a smartphone. I can't read on her person. Maybe I need to access the internet more. Apparently. Yes, you do. I or need, you need to read. Books. I need to go. I need, you to, need to violate your peace bond and go to the library. <laughs> I do. I do. I need to pick up a book. So this gets taken to court with her accused of violating the conduct of her peace bond, to which she the pleads... Con the conditions. Conditions. Please. You need to accompany me on my trip to the library. Hey, I guess con conduct and conditions of these books in the sentence. She well, she pleads not guilty. So regard and regardless of that, she spends the next few months in prison and is released in November of 2016 under a new two-year peace bond, which includes an additional condition that requires her to report any romantic relationship as well as reporting weekly to the police uh, by phone or in person. And that's really all we have on her. She's been keeping a low pro profile then, since then, probably because she's 85 years old. And yeah. <laughs> she's presumed to be alive, as we have no record of her, we couldn't find any record of her death or an obituary. And that's the story of the Internet Black Widow. Yeah. Are there any um, life lessons that you feel we can learn from this story? I think the best life lesson is don't murder people. <laughs> and that's all from us. See you next week. See you next week.